Guys, some of you may have noticed I did a video, uh, well I did three videos last week with a series of rankings on heavyweight boxers. Um, those are up on the channel, please do check them out if they're of interest. Off the back of me filming those videos, I got a lot of requests to discuss uh, top 10 pound for pound lists. Both top 10 in um, the UK and also top 10 globally. So. You know, seeing as people seem to be interested in that discussion, I always want to make videos that people want to watch, so I've had a little stab at it. I'm going to be referring to my mobile phone throughout this video uh, due to the fact that I've made a few notes which I've kept on it. So, yeah, uh, I'm going to rattle through it now. Um, before I get into it, in terms of the British pound for pound top 10, um, what I would say is that I have given. Um, as I always do when I'm doing rankings, I'm giving preference to resume. And what I'm considering when I'm ranking a pound for pound list is firstly, have one of these guys got a track record of beating other pound for pound level fighters? Obviously, there's less of that to an extent within the British list. We don't have too many fighters who've gone out and put in dominant wins over world level pound for pound fighters but that's always the first consideration um, moving on from that I consider where are they listed within their respective division you know are they considered to be the top fighter or you know certainly in the top two or three of their division who have they beaten who have they beaten within that division you know uh, have they beaten world champions in their division have they beaten fighters who are largely considered top five fighters within their division uh, have they maybe shown form across multiple weight classes? So I'm, I'm factoring in all of these factors before I even take into account the eye test, before I even take into the account the manner of victory. For me, if you start saying, oh, you've got to put this guy in the pound for pound list, he's knocking everyone out. If you start doing that, you favour prospects. You favour guys who fought a lower level of opposition and therefore have ran through. And I think what I'm more interested in in terms of assessing pound for pound capability is the guys with proven form at the highest level. Even if those wins come in tricky fights where they lose rounds, where they potentially get hurt, you know. Obviously, you also need to factor in losses. Uh, it's not just the case as who's got the best wins. If a fighter's got very, very good wins but has taken a few losses, unfortunately, that obviously. Um, you know, moves them down a peg or two. But anyway, we're going to start with the British list and we're going to do a, a top 10. So let me rattle through it. And uh, at number 10, I've gone for someone who may surprise some people in terms of the fact that he's made the top 10 on my list. But I've selected Ricky Burns. Um, and there's a few reasons I've done that, really. I guess first and foremost, and without really wanting to state the obvious, Ricky Burns, as we know, recently became a freeweight world champion. Now, the manner of his recent win over Di Rocco was hardly spectacular. Uh, the opponent looked European level if we're being charitable, let's put it that way. But nevertheless, uh, a guy in Ricky Burns who has shown he can perform at a credible and decent level uh, in free weight classes is always respectable. Uh, and for me, certainly the ability to perform uh, in more than one weight class is something to factor in when you are considering a pound-for-pound pound list. Um, Burns' resume, uh, he's got some very good wins in there. You know, historically, I guess he's most probably best known for his win over Kevin Mitchell earlier on in his career. Um, you know, there was also a win over Casillas, uh, Rocky Martinez, down at uh, the lightweights, etc. So, you know, uh, Burns has got some very, very credible wins to his name. Um, he has consistently fought at a top level. He's fought some big names in defeat, you know, Terence Crawford, Figueroa, etc. Um, and he's a freeweight world champion. And given, you know, there was a few names who I considered picking above him, uh, but I thought Ricky Burns deserved to be on the list. Ricky Burns, as we know, has taken some losses, some of them fairly bad losses over the past three or four years. Uh, had those losses not occurred, clearly with some of the wins he's had earlier on and with his free weight champion status, he could be a lot higher in this list than 10th. Uh, but obviously, 
you can't purely factor in wins. When you're talking resume, you've got to talk wins and losses. And it's because of those losses um, that you are, for me, that Ricky Burns deserves to be in the top 10, but probably towards the bottom of it. So let's start it off with Ricky Burns at number 10. At number 9, we've got an unbeaten fighter. We've got Billy Joe Saunders. Middleweight champion of the world. I believe it's the WBO version he holds. Billy Joe Saunders, a uh, very, very good fighter. Huge talent. For me, has the potential to uh, dramatically outperform being ninth and has the potential certainly to be considered near the top of this list in 12 months' time, perhaps. Uh, at present, the level of opposition uh, hasn't been there to be considered one of the top pound-for-pound pound fighters in Britain. Having said that, the level of opposition has been fairly strong. It may not be pound-for-pound pound leading, but it's been fairly strong in the context of British boxing. You know, Billy Joe, it's fair to say, cleaned up at British level. Uh, Nick Blackwell, Spike O'Sullivan, John Ryder, um, Chris Eubank Jr., who's obviously become a, a massive name and a world-rated fighter since. He's got some other decent form on his record as well. Uh, Emmanuel Bland, the Murra, um, Jared Fletcher. And of course his biggest win came when he won the world title against Andy Lee. Uh, Andy Lee was a, obviously a middleweight world champion who I think had had one or two defences of his belt. Lee was always known as a high-class operator. For me, Billy Joe, with his unbeaten resume, uh, he's one of the top three middleweights in the world as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he's certainly the top British middleweight as far as I'm concerned. He's unbeaten. He's got good wins over Andy Lee. He's got good wins over Chris Eubank Jr. I've got him at number nine. And he's a guy who can certainly move up that list for me. Um, if this was based on pure talent, pure eye test, I'd probably have him higher. Uh, but as I've already discussed, resume is key. And, you know, Billy Joe Saunders hasn't beaten the top names in his division. He's beaten top-tier names, but he hasn't beaten the top names. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how his career develops, let's put it that way. At number eight, I'm actually going to include a fighter who historically I've been quite down on, Anthony Troller. Troller is a guy who, based on the eye test, uh, has never struck me as a world-level fighter. But there have been massive improvements to his game of late massive improvements and he's really stepped it up he had two fights with Dolly's Perez first one being a draw second one winning by knockout uh, and then he fought the very very feared uh, uh, Ismail Barroso Barroso was just coming off a win over um, Kevin Mitchell so yeah yeah uh, I think Troller deserves to be included uh, like Billy Joe Saunders uh, he is a world champion in his division. He's got a huge fight coming up against Jorge Linares. And if he wins this, he can go up much higher than eighth. Uh, he does have earlier losses in his career, including uh, to Derry Matthews, for example. Um, and, you know, because of that, because Billy Joe's undefeated, I toyed with having Billy Joe above uh, Anthony Crawler. But I just felt Crawler's wins in Perez and Barroso were slightly higher class, just marginally higher class than Billy Joe's wins over Eubank and Andy Lee. So I've got Anthony Crawler at number eight, and you know he's put himself in a position where he can definitely jump to the top five in his very next fight um, if he beats Jorge Linares, who I think in my estimations is probably the number one lightweight in the world. Uh, you know, certainly hard to have Crawler out of the conversation of top three lightweights at present, the streak of form he's been in. So, yeah, I'm including uh, Anthony Crawler in at number eight. Moving on to number seven, Lee Selby. Selby, for me, hugely, hugely exciting talent. Undefeated. And with a relatively deep resume, actually. Although a resume that is lacking a, a sort of real, real grade A name, you know, and it's going to be hard for him. Some of the names in his division, Santa Cruz potentially, uh, Lomachenko potentially, Gary Russell Jr., there's some real good fighters in his division. But nevertheless, we've got an unbeaten fighter in Selby, a world champion in Selby, uh, and a guy who's beaten Evgeny Gelovitz, 
a guy who's beaten Montiel, a guy who's beaten Eric Hunter, a guy who earlier on in his career um, beat Stephen Swift, uh, sorry, Stephen Swifty Smith and uh, Ryan Wolf. You know, he's actually got a deeper resume than than you'd initially think when you, you look into him, Lee Selby. And he's won his fights in good fashion, you know, potentially some one or two things to uh, to work on maybe in his fights against Eric Hunter and Montiel. But he is towards the top of his division. He's undefeated. He's got some high-class names, and he's got quite a few high-class names on his resume. Um, and he, he's consistently performed. So, for me, I've got Lee Selby in at number seven. Uh, and he's certainly got the talent to go higher. Um, it's just going to be a question of whether he can get one of those big names in the ring. Uh, you know, a guy like Anthony Crawler, who I've got one place below him, certainly could jump well ahead of him for beating a guy like Jorge Linares, because there isn't the equivalent to a Linares on Selby's ledger at present. So it will be very, very interesting to see whether he uh, gets a win of that nature. Moving on at number six, possibly a controversial one, Amir Khan. And yeah, Amir Khan has got some bad losses on his career. He's got some bad losses by knockout on his career. Obviously, uh, most notably, Danny Garcia and Sal Canelo Alvarez. Both of those guys are top-class fighters. Both of those guys merit inclusion in the global pound-for-pound -pound list. And, you know, I'm going to film a video on the global pound-for-pound -pound list later. And we'll have to see if, in my estimations, those guys are in the top ten. You know, I'd need to have a bit of a think and sit down before filming that. But... Amir Khan's been knocked out, he's been stopped at the very top level, he's also had losses at a slightly lower level to Lamont Peterson and an even lower level than that to Bradis Prescott. So, taking into account his losses, taking into account that he's coming off a big loss, I found it hard to put Amir Khan higher than sixth. Having said that, in terms of the wins on his record, Amir Khan is a guy who's got some of the best wins in British boxing. Uh, let's not forget, he's a two-time world champion. He's fought in a variety of weight classes. Uh, you know, success at lightweight, world championship success at light welterweight, big fight success at welterweight, and more recently, middleweight, bizarrely, against Canelo. But, you know, Marcus Maidana, very, very, very good win uh, that, you know, Amir Khan had. This is the same Maidana who beat Adrian Broner and gave Floyd Mayweather hell. Uh, Devin Alexander, um when Devin Alexander was slightly fresher than he is now, uh, Luis Calazzo, you know, there's some, some real credible wins on Khan's level and credible wins on a global basis. You know, you look at a guy like Billy Joe Saunders, and I'm a massive Billy Joe Saunders fan, but, you know, his wins, Chris Eubank, Andy Lee, they're big wins in Britain. Amir Khan has done big wins globally. You know, as I say, to reiterate, Lewis Calazzo, Devin Alexander, Marcus Maidana. You know he's got a deep resume. There's, there's loads more names that you could pull out. Um, you know, Paulie Malinaji, for example. You know, you could keep going very easily. Uh, so I thought Amir Khan, even though his place has taken a definite knock with some of the losses, has some of the highest class wins in British boxing across different weight classes. He's a former world champion. He performs at the highest level. And uh, I've got Amir Khan at number six. One place ahead of him, at number five, I've got Kel Brook. Now, Kel Brook's wins are not quite as strong as Amir Khan's. But Kel Brook doesn't have the losses. And Kel Brook himself, um, if we consider Khan and Brook as welterweights, and I do consider them both as welterweights, to be honest. I know both of them are doing crazy things with weight at present. But, you know, if we look at them as welterweights... I think it's hard to have Kel Brook out of the top three welterweights in the world. I think there would be an argument to exclude Amir Khan from the top five welterweights in the world. And if you look at the best win at welterweight between the two, I still believe that's actually Kel Brook's win over Sean Porter. I kind of believe Kel Brook did a better job on Sean Porter than Keith Berman did, actually. That's a very, very strong win from Kel Brook. Um, and that win for me, obviously Kel Brook's undefeated, he's got the longest undefeated streak in British boxing, he's a world champion, uh, but that win over Sean Porter for me is, is a really strong form, and um, puts him top three in welterweight, in a division that has some of the biggest names in the sport, um, you know, Manny Pacquiao, Bradley, Keith Furman, those sort of names, so yeah, Kel Brook's right in that mix, and I know Kel Brook hasn't fought the elite, elite opposition outside of Porter. 
but he's got some very good other wins. I mean, um, Senchenko, for example, who had beaten up Ricky Hatton the fight before. Uh, Frankie Gavin, you know, th these aren't world level wins, but these are good wins in the context of British boxing. Um, there's one or two other names in there as well. You know, Kel Brook for me deserves inclusion at number five. As you guys know, Kel Brook will be fighting Gennady Golovkin next time out. And I think I will go as far as to say Kel Brook would jump from number five to number one in my list if he was able to beat Gennady Golovkin at middleweight. Uh, you know, I think in the context of British boxing, bearing in mind Brook is what I consider to be a welterweight, and bearing in mind Golovkin is the top middleweight in the world, if Brook could, you know, be 38 and 0 with Golovkin at middleweight, Porter at welterweight, world championships in both divisions, I think we'd have to consider him the number one British pound for pound fighter. So, what's this space? Certainly one with the potential to, to go higher. At number four, I've gone for Carl Frampton. And I don't want to get into a debate as to whether Ireland's in Great Britain or you know whether Carl Frampton's Northern Irish and you know whatever. Save that for uh, someone who wants to discuss politics. Uh, I've discussed Carl Frampton and British boxing before and had one or two uh, people commenting about uh, the ins and outs of uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland's links. So you know. Uh, Possibly uh, possibly not the right place to discuss that on a boxing channel. But I've put Carl Frampton at number four. And I've done that based on the fact that he is fight, uh, his wins over Kiko Martinez, who at the time I considered top five in his division, and Scott Quigg, who at the time I also considered top five in the division. Frampton was a unified champion at Super Bantam. I think he held two versions of the, uh, of the belt after his win over Scott Quigg, and he's now stepping up to featherweight. Uh, Frampton, undefeated, now fighting for a featherweight world title, I believe, against Leo Santa Cruz. Huge, huge, huge fight. I think he's an underdog in that fight, but uh, yeah, certainly a big boost for him in his career if he can uh, if he can get the win there. And for me, Carl Frampton is uh, very much towards the top of the list in terms of the top pound-for-pound -pound fighters. Um, in Britain at the moment. So moving on to the top three. At number three, I've gone for James De Gale. De Gale's got an earlier loss in his record to George Groves, but he's kind of left that form behind. You know, there was a suggestion that he was carrying an injury for uh, a good deal of time uh, during his earlier career, but he lost in a close fight to George Groves. But as I say, he's really left that form behind and has gone on, obviously, to be largely considered as the number one fighter in super middleweight. Uh, he's got big wins over Andre Durrell, big wins over Lucien Boutte, who subsequently failed a performance-enhancing drugs test. And I think it's fair to say the consensus would be that James DeGale is the number one fighter in his division. And I think I'm right in saying, and forgive me if I'm doing anyone a huge disservice, but if we look at the fighters I've rated below James DeGale by ranks 4 to 10 in my list, I don't think you could really consider any of them to confidently be classed as the number one fighter in their division. You know, Ricky Burns, who I've got a 10, no way is he the best light welter in the world. Billy Joe, obviously, you'd say he's behind Golovkin at middleweight, certainly. Uh, Crawler, I personally got him behind Linares at lightweight. Uh, Selby, you'd probably have him behind the likes of Gary Russell and um, Lomachenko at present. You know, number number six, I had Amir Khan. Certainly, you'd have him behind several names in his division. Brook, I personally would have him still behind the likes of Manny Pacquiao, etc. at welterweight. Um, and number four, we had Carl Frampton. You'd have him behind Rigondo at super bantamweight, and you know you'd probably have him behind a few names at featherweight just now. So James DeGale at number three, probably the first fighter you would think of as definitely the number one in his division. Some strong wins against the likes of Durrell and Boutte, and, and one or two other names as well in there, uh, and obviously a world champion in, in the weight class. So I've gone James DeGale at number three. At number two, another one you could arguably say is the best fighter in his division, and one of the unsung heroes, if you like, of British boxing, 
Jamie McDonald. Uh, you know, he's a guy who's not a glamorous fighter. He doesn't fight in a glamorous weight class. He doesn't carry huge punching power. He's got a very technical, hardcore stop fan style. He's not a big mouth. He doesn't create beef outside of the ring. Uh, you know, he he's a guy who flies under the radar, I guess you could say, in terms of celebrity status. But don't let that get it twisted. He is a genuine top, top class performer. And for me, his two wins away from home against Kamida were really solid form and proved that he probably is the number one in his division, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, obviously, some other bits and pieces of form on his resume, win over Stuart Hall, for example, um, you know, and, and a few other bits as well. Jamie McDonald, a fighter who deserves possibly more credit than he gets, and for me, very, very tight between McDonald and James DeGale. I basically thought McDonald's two wins over Kamida were slightly stronger than James DeGale's wins over Durrell and Boutte. Up in the air. I wouldn't have any problem if you swapped the order. My preference was just to go to McDonald. So you can probably guess who number one is by uh, process of elimination. Some people say to me, heavyweights should be, shouldn't be included in pound-for-pound pound conversations. And I completely disagree with the logic, you know. Um, for me, the whole purpose of pound for pound is to say, taking a side weight class, who is the best fighter in the world? Who has the best form in the world? Who has the strongest resume? Who has performed at the highest level? And the whole purpose of pound for pound is to compare and contrast people who will never fight because of drastically different weight divisions. The whole purpose of pound for pound is to have to debate who was the better fighter, um, Floyd Mayweather Jr. or Mike Tyson. You know, clearly we're not going to sit here and have a debate who would win in a fight, peak Floyd Mayweather Jr. or peak Mike Tyson, because that would be silly. But you can compare and contrast the resumes, you can compare and contrast the performances in the ring, you can compare and contrast the opponents they've beaten and how the opponents stack up, and you can say, taking the obvious weight advantages out of it, pound for pound, the welterweight was a better fighter than a heavyweight, if that's your opinion. So I totally disagree with the argument that heavyweight shouldn't be included in pound for pound. And as you can probably guess, the number one pound for pound fighter in Britain, for me, Tyson Fury. And there's one reason for it, and it boils down to a very, very, very simple logic. Tyson Fury beat the guy who was a definite pound-for-pound pound top five star in Vladimir Klitschko. He beat a guy who had reigned supreme for 10 years and who had looked unstoppable. He had beat a guy who had beaten up David Hay, Alexander Povetkin, Kubrat Pulev, etc. And that form... He's clearly the strongest form currently available in British boxing. Vladimir Klitschko is an all-time great heavyweight, who I genuinely consider to be a top 10 all-time great heavyweight. I probably, at the time of that Fury-Klitschko fight, had Vladimir Klitschko in the top 3 pound for pound in the world. Certainly in the top 5. And until a British fighter goes out and beats up an Andre Ward, a Sergei Kovalev, a Gennady Golovkin, someone of that stature, a Manny Pacquiao, until something like that happens, or until Fury takes losses, which he may do elsewhere, there isn't going to be a stronger claim to being the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in Britain. There isn't another name, you know. If you look at Jamie McDonald, if you look at James DeGale, if you look at Carl Frampton, these are superb fighters. That's why I've got them at the top of the list. None of them have beaten a pound-for-pound -pound top five guy. Um, none of them have beaten a fighter who's reigned supreme for ten years. And because of that, Tyson Fury has the strongest resume in British boxing and he is definitely the pound-for-pound -pound number one. Now... I'm going to wrap it up there. That's the top 10 pound for pound. I'm going to try and put some time aside and do a global pound for pound list. And I'm going to have to put a lot of thought into it 
sit down with a pen and paper, take some serious notes, and it'll be interesting to see if any of the, the top British pound for pound fighters make it onto the uh, the global pound for pound list. Um, you know, I know I know it's always a controversial topic, so leave your comments below. Uh, leave your agree, disagree, uh, I'm an idiot, great video, whatever you want to say, comments below. Let me say, if you comment something like, Tyson Fury can't be pound for pound number one, David Hay would beat him, then you're missing the point of what I'm trying to do here. What I am trying to do is assess the form, assess the wins and losses over highly rated opposition, and come up with a conclusion as to who is got the strongest claim to being pound for pound. Uh, it's not a head to head conversation, it's not a eye test conversation, it's who is proven at the highest level, who has beaten the highest level of opposition, uh, and that's how I've worked this out. So leave your comments below. Um, I hope I haven't forgotten anyone really, really obvious. I've tried not to, but maybe I have. If you've enjoyed the video, please do hit the thumbs up button. I'd really appreciate the support. Um, and if you're new to the channel, if you want to check out the, uh, the global pound for pound list when that goes up, please do hit subscribe so you uh, don't miss out and so you can check out the other stuff. Many thanks for watching, guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, and, yeah, I'm going to put some time aside as soon as I can and, and get this uh, global one done. So hopefully you guys... Uh, Tune into that one as well. Thanks for watching.